morning, and that's why we're here. Um, God is a holy God. He is our teacher. He is the one who loves us and calls us and wants to equip us so that we can continue to grow in our faith. Amen. Let's go ahead and come before the Lord then and ask Him to meet us here uh, to do all of that. Dear Jesus, we acknowledge you as our Lord and King. We thank you, Lord, for your tremendous grace. You died on the cross for us. You called us. We are yours. We acknowledge that there is nothing we can do apart from you. And we pray, Lord, that you would meet us here now. We pray your spirit would, we call upon your spirit now to meet us here, to open our hearts, our eyes, and our ears to spiritual truth, that you would be our teacher, and we would receive everything the spirit has to say to us today. So we commit our time to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Open, the, open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Pastor Eli has completed First and Second Thessalonians uh, last week before he left. And uh, we're, we are going to begin the book of Ephesians. <laughs> Ephesians is an epistle. An epistle is a letter that is written by an apostle. The Apostle Paul in this case. The Apostle Paul wrote 13 epistles and Ephesians is the first prison epistle. He wrote this letter to the church of Ephesus while he was in Rome, in a prison in Rome. Paul was an apostle, it says there in verse 1. An apostle is one who is sent out. There were 12 disciples that followed Jesus. They are known as the original 12 apostles. But Paul was not one of the 12. But he was sent out on three missionary journeys, ministering to the Gentiles in that region. Ephesus was one of the places he spent the most time in, about three years. And now we find him in house arrest in Rome. And he is writing a letter to the church of Ephesus, to the Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is divided into two sections, six chapters. The first three chapters deal with doctrine. The last three chapters deal with practice orthodoxy and orthopraxy correct doctrine and correct practice very important that we have both sometimes in our Christian life we are heavy on one side we learn all the doctrine but we don't practice any of it something's wrong sometimes we do all the practice but we don't know what foundation the doctrine is based on very easy to be doing practice for the wrong reason interesting also in the book of Revelation um, we study that John had a vision and he's and and the Lord says right for these things are true and faithful in chapters 2 and 3 John writes to the seven churches the first church is Ephesus. In each of the churches that John writes, there is commendation, approval, good things, as well as condemnation. And for Ephesus, the commendation, the good things they were doing was the praxis, the orthopraxy. They were practicing and doing a lot of good works. The condemnation for Ephesus was you have left your first love. So 
it's easy to see that these guys are doing a lot of good works for the wrong reason. Our good works needs to come out of our love for Jesus Christ. Amen. And as Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians, he wants to encourage them. But let's go back to verse 1 and follow along as I read. Today we will do uh, an expository teaching. We're going to go verse by verse. We're going to um, identify some key words. We're going to tear it apart and we're going to see uh, what Paul was trying to do here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul starts off this letter by identifying himself as the author of this letter. He is an apostle, one that is sent out by Jesus Christ by the will of God. And he is writing to who? The saints. Who are the saints? They are believers. So this letter is not to the general public. It is not to uh, the unsaved. He's not ministering uh, to the unsaved in this letter, but he is writing to encourage true believers, the saints. And he says in verse 2, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This letter applies today. It was written in 64 AD about 2,000 years ago. But this letter could have been written just yesterday because everything that this is in this letter applies to us today. In fact, this letter could be written like this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Mililani and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace from God our Father. This letter that Paul wrote applies to every one of us today. We are saints. We are believers. And he is writing to encourage us. What is the encouragement? The encouragement comes in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. People, we are blessed. You are blessed. And Paul is encouraging the church in Ephesus that you guys are a blessed people. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. How easy is it for us to have that truth but not know it and, and live ignorant of our blessings in heaven, our spiritual blessings? Let me give you an example. Um, before my mom passed away, how many of you have ever been on a cruise before? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. Wow. I got a bunch of you. Before my mom passed away, one of, her, one of the things she wanted to do is get the whole family together and go on a cruise together. My mom battled cancer for eight years. And shortly before she passed, that was her wish. And so, um, we've never been on a cruise before. And so, we uh, took the, the Hawaiian Island cruise, uh, you know, island hopping right here. And uh, we were looking at Alaska, but it would have been too much for my mom because uh, uh, her health was not the best at that time. But going island hopping right here in Hawaii, hey, that's something she could do. So we went. And my two brothers, their families, my niece says, my nephews, their cousins. We had a blast. We've never been on a cruise. You know, 24-7, you're on the same, you're on the boat together. But everybody has their own separate room. Talk about the food. The food galore. All decks you got food. Um, so, and, and the food is like buffet style. You can eat as much as you want. So, I remember my brothers, um, you know, we would go and eat. And then they got, you know, uh, activities or shows or whatever, you know, um, uh, in the evening. But then it's like, hey, 11 o'clock, let's all meet up at the dining area. And then we all had sign in and stuff. So it's like, yeah, man, you just, you just keep eating. Well, there's a story about a guy who went on a cruise. And um, he went on a cruise for five days. But at five o'clock, when they sound the horn, he would take out his little bag that he carried with him 
while everybody else is eating the smorgasbord of seafood and food galore, he would open his bag and take out his little crackers and his bottle of water. And he would eat that and um, that would be his, his meal. And then he did that every night, every day. But the last day, some people just couldn't um, resist. They had to ask him, why, why, you know, so they asked him, he says, why are you eating these crackers when all this food is available to you? He goes, it is? He goes, I thought you got to pay extra for, for all of that. And, and they told him, no, it, all this food is, comes with the price of the admission on the cruise. And, and that was, that was it. When we think about it, that can be us. We are so rich in the heavenly places. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing. And yet, if we don't know what we have in Christ, we can be living our lives as paupers. Extremely poor, spiritually poor people on earth when we're ignorant about what we have. That is why Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians because he wanted to encourage them and remind them of their spiritual blessings and riches that they already have in Christ. Amen? Amen. The same for us. It is so easy for us to go to church, serve God, do all of it, and miss what we have. We are so blessed in the heavenly places. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. One of the blessings is right here. Who am I in Christ? And we're going to make a list. Um, in the first two to three chapters of Ephesians, there is over a dozen of blessings that we have. The first one in verse 4 says, I am chosen. Just as he chose you. How many of you um, are saved and you're going to go to heaven? Okay. That means you are chosen. You have been chosen. Now, um, real briefly, without going into uh, too much, we have theologians over the years that have tried to rectify God's sovereignty and man's will in relation to salvation. All right? And Pastor Eli on a couple of uh, uh, sermons had made uh, reference to that. Okay, so just uh, elaborate just a little bit. All right, on one end, we have one spectrum, but on opposite ends, there's a guy by the name of John Calvin in the 1500s. And um, so he's on one end, and the other and a guy by the name of Jacobus Arminius came after him. And this is all about 1500s, early 1600s, right? And John Calvin says on one hand that God chooses who is saved and who he, he chooses who is saved. It's God initiating, God chooses, and that's why people get saved. Arminius, on the other hand, says, no, we have free will. And so it is man who takes the initiative to choose God. And when man chooses God, then God works with that faith. All right. Now, on either extreme, there's problems with both. So each of us need to wrestle and rectify and come up with how does this thing work. And we won't be able to figure out. Okay, several things. One, is we're finite and with finite minds we cannot understand and figure out an infinite God okay but we know God's heart God is not willing that any should perish so we know that God wants everybody to be saved okay on the strictly Calvinist side is God selects who gets saved all right but we know God's heart is he, he's not willing that any should perish we know that God's heart, the Great Commission, is go into all the world 
and do two things. Preach the gospel, make disciples. Okay? To every creature. All right? And so we know that that's important to God because that is His great commission. And so, anyway, uh, I'll leave you with that because uh, someone said, if you try to explain it, you're going to lose your mind. But if you don't believe it, you'll lose your soul. So, uh, you know, and the theologians are still debating this uh, for centuries and still going on. But it's probably somewhere in between, you know. And, uh, but the fact that you're saved and you're going to go to heaven, the Bible tells us in verse 4, is that you are chosen. God has chosen you. And that is a blessing. A tremendous blessing. Um, for those, okay. Um, to be chosen means that God elected you. You are picked. And um, you belong to Jesus. And that is, again, a tremendous blessing. So how should we live knowing that you are chosen by God? God picked you. You are elected, right? How should we live? It says we should live holy and blameless lives before Him in love. What does it mean to uh, live a holy life? We know that we are sinners. We know that we are flawed and imperfect. We know that we cannot live sinless lives, right? But Scripture commands us to live holy lives knowing that we are chosen before the foundations of the world began. Okay? So, we are to live holy lives. Holy lives mean to be separate, to be set apart, to be sanctified. You've heard it said that we are in the world, but we are not to be of it. Right? So we as Christians need to live differently from that of the world. In our minds, in our thoughts, in our words, in our attitudes, and in our behavior, it has to be different from that from the world. If you work in a secular place, somebody needs to notice that there is something different about you, about the way you live, about your attitude, and about the way you respond to the same situation that these people are in. There needs to be something different. There's many areas of our life that we need to be separate and set apart. Okay? And so, one, when I think of being holy, um, I think of being pure. Um, you know, my wife, always says clay you need to be a holy man you need to be a holy man and scripture points it out right there that we need to be holy and blameless before him uh, we went recently to a discipleship conference uh, there was a few of us from our church and one of the speakers was interesting that he uh, was mentioning um, the internet pornography is is just getting out of hand and this is the first time I heard a statistic um, and he was mentioning it is growing among the eight-year-olds uh, boys as well as girls and not only just the boys but among eight-year-olds I've never heard that before normally you know so we're dealing with something today that is so accessible but as Christians this is just one area, sexual purity is just one area that we need to be set apart and live different from the world. There's all, there's all areas, right? And so, um, when he mentioned that, uh, I, it just caught me by surprise because I, I didn't realize, you know, that that was a, a statistic um, that was happening. Um, so internet pornography is, is, is a problem in, in our culture, and, um, but for the church, we should have no place with that. Um, we need to be separate and set apart. Uh, this is something that will destroy uh, 
lives. And uh, but we're living in this culture, right? So it's men and women. Um, we went well. Blameless lives. Blameless lives. What does that mean? And when I think of blameless living a blameless life, I think about Daniel. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, there he was conspired against by these people. And they were looking for fault in his life. But they could not find any fault uh, with him. That should be our lives. When people look to accuse you, they should not be able to find any fault with us. That's what blameless means. And Daniel... He was a blameless man. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. And their conclusion was, unless it has something to do with his God. Because he would get on his knees three times a day and pray to his God, giving thanks and asking God for help. After conspiring against Daniel and set him up, he continued to get on his knees three times a day. And... Um, you know the story. God saved him from the lion's den. But Daniel is a man that inspires me because when people look for things in your life to accuse you of, they couldn't find anything uh, with him. I remember a time when um, it was at night and I needed to go to uh, Safeway uh, shopping. You know, I mean, just pick up something, right? And I thought to myself, oh, I'm not going to comb my hair. I, I'm not going to see anybody. It's, it's probably late. Nobody's going to be there. And guess what? I go there and there's somebody I know. We end up talking story and I'm all embarrassed because my hair all messy and you know, sticking up or something, you know. And isn't it interesting that every time we think that it's not going to happen, it happens, you know, whatever it is. And I think that's what it means by living a blameless life doing the things that we know we need to do and not taking chances uh, with it. Amen? All right. So we need to live holy lives and blameless lives as a result knowing that God has chosen us. He chose us before the foundations of the world, it says, to be with Him. <coughs> we are blessed. All right. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoptions as sons. All right. Now, another blessing that we have is we are adopted. You are grafted in. All right. Um, the Gentiles. Right now, it's the time, we're living in the times of the Gentiles. The Jews are God's chosen people. There will be a time when the Jews come to recognize their true Messiah at the end of the tribulation. But right now, we are adopted. We're grafted in. Us Gentiles, we get in on the deal. All right. So it's wonderful to be adopted into God's family. All right. So we are adopted by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Another spiritual blessing right here. We are accepted in the beloved. Who is the beloved? The beloved Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the beloved Son. And I remember when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, the heavens opened, and there was a voice from heaven that came out and cried out. What did, what did this voice say? My beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Scripture teaches us that we are accepted in the beloved. We are accepted. Jesus Christ has accepted us. He took us in and we are blessed. Another spiritual blessing. Interesting that we're blessed because we cannot, we're accepted by God through Christ Jesus because we cannot make ourselves accepted by Him. 
to be accepted, it was, again, his choosing, yeah? And uh, we cannot make ourselves accepted, but out of his goodness and his grace, we are accepted. Verse 7, in him we have the redemption through the blood. Another spiritual blessing, you and I are redeemed. We are redeemed. What does that mean? That we were bought at a price. The Bible says that we were bought. Out of all the things that God could purchase, He purchased you and He purchased me. And He paid for it with everything He had, His own life. We are bought by His blood. He purchased us with His blood. If you went to the store, and you could purchase anything you wanted to and you picked one thing and you spent all your money on that the reason you would have done something like that is because you value that that thing well god values you and he redeemed you and he purchased you with his own blood you are blessed him we also have the forgiveness of sins and let's think about it the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God all have sinned we are sinners we're born into this sinful nature one day the Bible says it's appointed on a man once to die and then the judgment we're gonna face God in judgment but when we stand before a holy God our sins not be there the Bible says your sins as though like scarlet will be whiter than snow as far as the east is from the west so far as I have removed your sins we are spiritually rich because you no longer have to bear your sins your sins are forgiven you have been bought at a price you have been chosen. You have been adopted and accepted into the family of God. The spiritual blessings that we, ex that we share are spiritual and eternal. Interesting that God does not promise us earthly riches. There are many doctrines out there today that teach Another doctrine. Many false teachers today that says come to church and the more you give, the more God is going to bless you and prosper you. You don't have because you lack faith. You're sick because that's not God's will for you. God's will is not for you to be sick. So you need more faith and you need to give more. Another doctrine, false teaching, that is not the teachings of the Bible. The teachings of the Bible, God says you are spiritually rich because all of your riches are in heaven, in the spiritual places. How much more do we want something that will last for eternity than something temporal? Compare being earthly rich versus spiritually rich. No comparison. One commentator said it's, it's like only pennies and you're rich here on earth compared to being rich in heaven. And, and Paul wants to let the church of Ephesians as well as the, our church here in Mililani to know how spiritually rich we are. Alright. As the wind blows my pages, I am now in 1 Corinthians. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> okay, all right. It's a challenge to uh, see. I, 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 I take for granted I got two hands and I always use two hands. But when you're up here holding the microphone, you only got one hand and it's the left hand. So, <laughs> not that easy. Okay, here we go. All right. So we're redeemed and we have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. I want to talk about grace. 
in verse 2 it says grace to you and peace to you and here in verse 7 we have the riches of his grace let's talk about grace for a little bit what is grace grace is something that we experienced here this morning when pastor Eli was planning to go to Nepal he knew that we we're going to be shorthanded over here setting up our canopy this morning grace of God doing in your life where you have favor it is God's doing God's grace it's not something you could have done but it's God doing it in and through your life look at all the grace that God has given you the favor um, the blessings I mean there are so much things we cannot control like the weather today I mean, it all, I mean, we're looking at it at 60%, 50%, 40 back up to 50 and it's like, oh man, you know. But that's another example of the grace of God for us to be up here today. God is gracious, and that's why Paul starts off as he introduces this letter. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Chuck, Chuck Smith says, it's always in that order, grace and peace. It's never peace and grace. You will never have the peace of God without the grace of God. And it's only by the grace of God you can experience God's peace because you know it's all Him. I mean, when we gathered this morning in that circle, that's all I was. I was just, I was just full of God's peace because of His grace. Look at what God has done. And that's just one example. But look at all the grace God has poured out in your life. You know, you know what's, what's, a, what's a neat exercise? go home. Next time you're feeling down, you go home, get out a sheet of paper and start writing, making a list of all God's grace in your life. It'll blow your mind. The problem is we forget. And for the Ephesians, they forgot. They forgot all their blessings. They were saved and they're doing all this work for God. But they forgot all the blessings that they had. the dispensation dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ dispensation is the unfolding of God's plan and events over history and God is the one from the beginning of the foundations of the world he has this plan for us to be saved to be with him for all of eternity the dispensation of the fullness of the times Verse 11, in him we also
also have obtained an inheritance. Wow, do you know that you are an heir? Um, we are heirs because we will receive this inheritance. You know, when you think about an heir, it's like, okay, when your great uncle who was super rich dies, you're an heir, you're gonna inherit all his, his riches, you know. But the Bible teaches that we are heirs because we have this inheritance. When we die and go to heaven, we have all the spiritual blessings for all of eternity. Going to heaven is one of the things that we will inherit. Being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. People, we are rich, we have spiritual blessings, we are heirs, we will inherit. Verse 13, in Him you also trusted after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed. Wow, another blessing, look at it. I'm chosen, adopted, accepted, redeemed, forgiven, I'm an heir, and now I am sealed. You are sealed, what are you sealed with? You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? And when did that happen? The moment that you opened your heart to Jesus, the Holy Spirit has come in and never left. The presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart is the mark, is the seal that you are saved, that you are a child of God, and that you are destined to heaven for all of eternity. You're sealed. Let's elaborate that just a little bit. If I went to the post office and I had two boxes, and I paid for one, and there's a destination of where this box is gonna go, and they put a stamp on it, first class, whatever, and then they seal it with postage. It's already paid for, it's gonna go. The other box I didn't pay for yet. And if I went home, only one box is gonna go. There's only one box is gonna make it. Why? Because that box is sealed, it is stamped, it has the approval, it's already paid for. It's gonna go to that destination. That's what the seal of the Holy Spirit will do for you. You are stamped. You are approved. You are sealed. You have a destination because the Holy Spirit is in you. The moment that you opened your heart to Jesus, the moment that you said, I want Jesus to come in and forgive me of my sins. I believe He is the Son of God. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I want Jesus to be my Lord. You have the seal of this Holy Spirit for all of eternity. And for those of you that have genuinely invited Jesus in your heart, the Holy Spirit has never left you and will never leave you. And that seal of that Holy Spirit will take you to heaven. You are blessed. And there is nothing that will take the Holy Spirit away from you. You're sealed. All right. Okay, now I'm in the book of Galatians, so bear with me. Okay, here we go. All right. Verse 14. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Wow. We don't want to live like the guy on the cruise taking out crackers, <laughs> thinking that all of this food is not entitled to us. Okay, you know what, by the way, when I came back from the cruise, I think I gave 10 pounds. You know, I should have been the guy eating crackers. <laughs> I tell you, you gotta, you gotta really watch yourself on these cruises, but um, yeah, the food is anyway, crazy, crazy. Um, well, Paul is writing this letter to us today and he wants us to know that we are spiritually rich we have inherited so we need how should we live our lives we need to 
live our lives knowing and having this. That, that there's nothing that will take this away from us. We have the guarantee. It is a promise. Uh, we have been bought with a price. God has chosen us. Uh, we are saved. And uh, our, our eternity, our home is not here. This is not our home. We're just passing through. So, so how should we live? How should we live knowing that this is not our home and we're passing through? Well, I tell you what are the wisest things that we can do. Okay, For those of you who are saved, you rose your hand. You said, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. One of the wisest things that you can do while we're still here on earth is this. Take as many people with you as you possibly can. Every day that you still here on earth, you have an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. Amen? Amen. Yesterday, talk about the grace of God. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, another example of the grace of God. Yesterday, I was asked to, well, yesterday I did a, a funeral service for a, my sister-in-law's family. And, um, we did a graveside and at the end of the service I gave an invitation for people. Six out of twelve people rose their hand to receive Jesus. Um, I don't know these people, right? They're my sister-in-law side of the family, so I really don't know them. But we have within us are entrusted with one of the most powerful information on the planet. Pastor Rick used to tell me that uh, years ago when I first got started. He said, Clay, you and I are custodians of the most important information on the planet. And uh, the gospel message, that was falling, but we ain't going to fall. <laughs> We're sealed, we got the guarantee, we got the down payment, we're blessed. Bill, if that falls again, that's okay, we got them, we got them. We know where we had it, that's okay, thank you. Talk about the grace of God. God was working in the lives of these people. And I was able to share the gospel message. And people responded. That's the grace of God. You know why? Because God was doing the work in each of their lives before. I mean, I never had an opportunity. It's not like it's not like any of us can save somebody. No way. It is impossible for one man to save another man. It's only by the grace of God that God is working in a person's life. But He uses us to share the gospel and people respond. Amen. When, when that happened, it was like, wow. There's this is just the grace of God. This is and, and it's amazing. And guess and, and you know what's neat about this whole thing? When you recognize that it is the grace of God that's doing the work, guess who gets the glory? Only God. Because it's nothing that we can do. It's all God. But we have the privilege of partnering with God. And for whatever reason, God blesses us by letting us partner with Jesus to do the work of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, all right. All right. So, all right. Let me share with you three stories about sharing our faith. Um, you know, sharing our faith, and, and, and then we're going to close with this for today. Okay, next week, we got communion coming. So we want to prepare our hearts for that. It's the last Sunday of the month. We want to continue in the book of Ephesians. And then uh, we got one more week together before uh, the Nepal team comes back. And then we'll see uh, how far we get. Uh, we're going to just continue moving in the book of Ephesians. So if you want to read ahead of time, just start reading. But you know what? Get alone with God. Meditate. Receive it. And hold on to these truths. 
these things are going to change your life. It's going to change your life. Okay, um, I just want to encourage you about sharing our faith. All right, so three stories. One is, um, it's always scary to share your faith because you go up to somebody, or most times you don't know the person, so it's kind of scary. And the other times, it's people you know, and that's even more scary. So, <laughs> so sharing your faith is kind of scary. But, how do we overcome fear? By faith. Faith and fear are opposites. You cannot have faith and be fearful. And you cannot be fearful and have faith. So it is by faith. But remembering that it is all by the grace of God. It ain't you doing any of it. It's by the grace of God. So you pray and you say, God, give me the grace. Lead me to somebody and just go. The second thing you do is you just got to open your mouth. You cannot uh, approach somebody and not say anything. You got to say something. Okay. So you got to say something. All right. So I went up to, the, I was doing my walk in, in the morning. And I came across this Filipino lady. She was uh, by herself walking also. And um, we started talking. And I said, um, you know, hi, how are you? You know, what's your name? And I shared my name and, and we started talking. And she says, oh, and she has this accent. So it's kind of hard for me to fully understand, but we were talking, we were connecting. And that's one of the keys for sharing your faith is you gotta connect. You gotta connect somehow, right? So she says, oh, oh, Clayton, oh, okay, hey, um, um, there's a president with that name. And I'm thinking, McKinley, Taft, Grant, and I said, no, 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 no more. She goes, yeah, 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 there's a president with, yeah, with that name. And then I'm thinking, Washington, Lincoln, Adams, and I thought, no, no more. And Look at me insisting, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, what's she thinking about? And then I'm thinking, oh, you think, you think, I said, oh, you thinking Clinton, my name Clinton. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, we had good fun. But, but anyway, that was the beginning and then eventually um, I shared the gospel. She said she believes and then she had to go. So that was one story. Um, so sharing your faith is actually fun. You, you'll have a lot of fun doing it. Um, another one, let's see, who was Steve O'Tuck? He was at my house uh, picking up something. So my back was over there, Steve was there. And we're by the, uh, my driveway and then he waves. So I turn around and it's this uh, older couple walking who I've never seen before in my life. And so Steve, he wave at him and then I turn around and then Steve, he take off. <laughs> so Steve, he jumped in his car and he left. So I was stuck with these two people, right? So then I said, oh, hi. And they're admiring Lisa's uh, trees and garden. She goes, oh, what is this guava? I go, yeah, yeah, this guava. Anyway, come to find out the guy works for the State Department uh, with plants and pest control and all that stuff. And so we were long story short, but we didn't. But from the uh, strawberry plants, they moved to my fig tree in the front, you know, with a fig tree. And they're admiring all the figs. So they say, yeah, this is, they say, is this fig? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they wow, you know. So then I say, okay, wait, I'll go pick two figs. I give one to the man, one to the lady, right? And then we're talking about, oh, what do you do, and blah, 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 blah. Long story short, um, the man, he eating his fig. And, and he go, oh, this is sweet, this is good. And then for the lady, she's when I look, the lady, she's still holding her fig. I say, you're not going to eat them. She goes, oh, no, I'm going to save them. I'm going to make soup because she's Chinese. And I go, oh, yeah, that's what I do with my figs, and I make soup. And I said, but the poor lady only get, you cannot make soup only with one fig. And she holding them and she gonna save them. So I said, you know, I'll wait. So I went to my freezer, I bring up my gallon Ziploc bag full of figs. And then I give it to her. And I said, here, you go take this, you go, you go, um, you go make your soup or whatever. See, that's part of when sharing your faith. And then of course I shared my faith. And uh, they, they say, oh no, um, 
you know, they know about Christianity. He went to the university, took religion class, and I'm thinking, yeah, I took the same class. That confused me more than anything. I'm thinking, that ain't good. He goes, yeah, okay, I know about it, because, you know, I share in the gospel. And and they said, well, maybe we come to your church one day. And I says, uh, okay, we're over here. And I said, well, um, um, and the guy is, uh, he says he's the only one in the state who has his position. Um, and he's with, you know, so I was telling him about, yeah, I know this guy named Josiah, he with Nematodes. He goes, yeah, I know Nematodes, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, and so, so I said, hey, don't wait too long to come to church. Why don't you come tomorrow? This was Saturday. He said, oh, no. I got to wait until I retire, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I said, hey, you're the only guy in the state. You ain't going to retire. You got to come to church. But anyway, you know, you're just making connections with people, making bridges, relating to them somehow, and, um, and, and just loving on people. You know what the Apostle Paul said? What did he say? He says, for him, he wants to be all things to all men. Why? So that he can save some. You know? And we need to be all things to all people, uh, even strangers, people you don't know. But you, you be a blessing to them. You love on them. And that way, they will know that it's something different. You know? You know, I go to that house. They don't give me nothing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but, you know, you never know. God has blessed us so we can be a blessing to others and so and, and we relate to people Paul says I become I'm a Jew I become a Jew to the Jews uh, I become you know this to that person so that I might win some so whatever we need to become to these people we need to become yeah all right um, oh and then uh, one, one last story, uh, I, I changed my credit card, so I was calling this, uh, I don't know, this one company to let them know I gotta, you know, take it out of this card instead of the old card. <laughs> so first thing he asked me on the telephone, and I don't know why I'm talking to this guy, you know, he's, a, he's on a mainland or in another country or whatever. He said, oh, how's your day going? So I said, oh, great. And he responds to me by telling me, oh, that's interesting. You know, you're the first guy that said, great. So then I answer him and I said, well, what all the other guys say? <laughs> they say, oh, I'm okay, or so-so, or whatever. He says, yeah, you're the first guy that said, that answer, great. And I say, you know why I say great? Because, um, because I'm blessed, because Jesus blessed me. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. Although I probably wasn't doing too good, but anyway. <laughs> I just thought I was good. Anyway, yeah. um, so I said, so I said, hey, so do you know Jesus? He goes, I know about him. I go, you know about him or you know him? He goes, oh, I, I just, I, I, I know about him. And, uh, you know, then he shared a little bit. And of course, we're on a recorded line, right? So <laughs> he shared a little bit. But before we end, I just said, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? He said, sure. So I pray for him. See, you just never know how um, the Lord will use. And it may be a seed. See, those six guys that rose their hand got saved yesterday at the floor, I never knew them. But God, by His grace, was preparing their hearts. And maybe seeds were planted along the way, and then I just gave the invitation and they responded. You may be a seed sower, or you may be a harvester, or you may share, and the person may not receive it at all. But we don't hold on to the results. We That's between them and God. Our responsibility is to be faithful to God with the blessings that we have. And the reason why we want to share is because these blessings can be for them too. God, Jesus died for the whole world. For God so loved the world that he spent, he, he spent his only son, he gave his only son, and he purchased us with his blood. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance, amen? So we have the blessing, the opportunity, while we're still here. So knowing that we have this, what is the wise thing to do? Take as many as you can with you. Amen? Alright, Jim.
once you come up, we're going to close. And as it Jim comes up, um, let, let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us today. Thank you for blessing us in the spiritual realm. So much powerful blessings. Help us not to live defeated lives and discouraged and depressed lives as Christians. No reason for that. We have an eternity to look forward to and we are tremendously blessed in the heavenly places. And it's all because of what you did for us. All by the grace of God. And, and help us, Lord, to be encouraged to take as many people as we can to share our, our faith with them. And, and we ask you, bless, thank you for all your people. And these people here that came to church today, bless them. They are precious in your sight. We thank you in Jesus.